It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Turkish President Erdogan recently shut down over 130 media outlets. Apparently, this is in connection with the ongoing crackdown on dissent following the July 15 failed coup d'etat. The crackdown has led to the dismissal of tens of thousands of university professors, teachers, soldiers, police officers, and other government employees. Meanwhile, Erdogan also announced that he will be meeting with Russia's President Vladimir Putin in St. Petersburg in early August. Erdogan also has been under increasing pressure from Western allies because of the post-coup crackdown. Further, some of President Erdogan's political allies in Turkey are even suggesting that U.S was behind the coup attempt. Increasing tensions with the U.S. and Europe, Erdogan is looking for a new ally in Russia. If so, this would represent a major shift in regional alliances, since Turkey has been a member of NATO ever since its founding. With us to discuss the latest developments in Turkey and how they relate to the region is Vijay Prasad. Vijay is George and Martha Kellner Chair in South Asian History and Professor of International Studies at Trinity College. One of his latest books is Letters to Palestine, Writers Respond to War and Occupation. He joins us today from Northampton, Massachusetts. Good to have you with us, Vijay. Pleasure, thanks. So Vijay, much has happened uh, since the uh, coup, and of course, the, particularly the allegations and some of Erdogan's uh, political allies coming out and blaming the U.S. Uh, for the coup. Is there any merit to that? Well, it's hard to say, you know, what's going on. Uh, Mr. Gulen, uh, who is used to be Erdogan's partner, a uh, very close ally, in fact, is, is, is in sort of exile in the United States. And Erdogan has blamed Gulen for the coup. Now, it's not unlikely that the Gulenists have been involved in this. You know, it's, it's very possible that they have played a part in it. Uh, but, you know, it's very hard to say if the United States government has been involved. Um, the Erdogan government has taken a strong position vis-a-vis -vis, um, the United States. Uh, for, I think, uh, some hours, the power was shut off at the Incherlik air base from which the United States bombs um, ISIS targets in Syria, you know, as a way of saying, look, uh, you know, we're not interested in, in, in niceties here. Uh, we're, we're worried about the situation. They wanted to put some pressure on the United States to extradite Mr. Gulen uh, back to Turkey. So, you know, Sharmini, it's hard to say really, um, you know, why this coup happened, uh, who is responsible. And one of the reasons it's particularly difficult is that Mr. Erdogan has used this coup to clean up all his opponents. So he's blaming essentially everybody for the coup and is closing down media outlets, you know, has decided to uh, arrest as many people as possible. So because he's cast such a wide net against his opponents, it's in a sense uh, obfuscated the actual uh, coup that took place and the reasons for that coup. And uh, give us a sense of some of the reasons. Well, there are many people who would uh, have reason to uh, be upset with Mr. Erdogan. Uh, there are sections of the military uh, that have uh, Republican pretensions that believe that Mr. Erdogan has gone too far with the Islamization of Turkey. Uh, there are other sections of the military that are indeed, uh, you know, uh, close to Mr. Gulen. In fact, Mr. Erdogan had himself colluded with Gulen a decade ago to put these people into positions of importance in the military, in the judiciary, in other institutions, in order to, in a sense, uh, box in the Republicans, those who were Kemalists or, or who had affinity to a secular Turkish state. So it could very well be the Gulenists who have felt that, um, you know, Mr. Erdogan, as his power has increased, uh, has has basically pushed for his own agenda rather than their combined agenda. It could be sections of the military that have been unhappy with the way in which they've been utilized in the war against the Kurds in the southeastern part of Turkey, as well as uh, in the way they've been asked to manage the border uh, with Syria. You know, the, the, the head of the Second Army in Turkey has been arrested 
Uh, he is one of the most important people in managing that border. And if he had indeed been a part of this coup, um, you know, it's likely that those frustrations might have played a role here. So, as I said, there's many reasons why uh, people in the military might have gone after Mr. Erdogan. It's hard to specify exactly which of these reasons played the role because Mr. Erdogan has gone after everybody. Now, how uh, agitated, aggravated is he? And what is this new alliance uh, or reestablishing relations with Russia all about um, that he's risking uh, being a part of NATO and possibly entry into the European Union as well? Well, you know, if you look back at uh, the Erdogan, uh, you know, uh, history since 2003 at least, there was a very important attempt uh, to move Turkey towards Europe, uh, to utilize the proximity to Europe, uh, to insulate Erdogan's attempt to create an Islamic government in Turkey from the military. You know, he had hoped essentially that the, that the link with Europe would put military coups off the table because the Europeans, of course, would not uh, look kindly towards a military coup. So Erdogan essentially became a so-called NATO's Islamist in the early years uh, in power. He was very eager to turn Turkey into an aircraft carrier against Iraq in 2003. So in the early years, he had a very close fealty to the Europeans and NATO. Of course, Turkey's own economic expansion in the 2000s had not altogether that much to do with Europe. It had much more to do with the Arab world where the Turks were able to enter, you know, as real estate uh, developers that, that is in construction, selling consumer goods, entering into financial, uh, you know, into financial markets and so on. And Turkey made essentially a huge amount of money uh, as Syria liberalized its economy in the 2000s. So, so Turkey played an interesting role between Europe and the Arab world uh, and with Erdogan trying to hedge his position so as to protect himself from the military. When the Syrian uprising uh, took place in 2011, Erdogan took the most advanced position against the Assad government, calling very early for his removal, uh, essentially uh, going beyond the Gulf Arabs and the West, but then uh, quickly harmonizing with them, you know, uh, hoping that a Syrian Muslim Brotherhood regime come to power in Damascus. Uh, that attempt, that going so far ahead of everybody else, has uh, led to the destabilization of Turkey. It has, you know, once again restarted its war against the Kurds. That's entirely uh, a consequence of this forward policy in Syria. It has led to a lot of pressure on the military, uh, which uh, is not keen to enter into a conflict inside Syria. So, so Turkey essentially has seen the unraveling of everything that Erdogan has tried to stitch together, you know, whether it's the proximity to Europe, using that to its advantage, or using the new markets in the Arab world uh, to its economic advantage. And I think uh, having gone so far in, it's had a very hard time extricating itself from its politics in Syria. You, you, you remember that last year, um, it was Turkish planes that shot down a Russian plane, um, you know, uh, that had uh, apparently strayed into Turkish airspace. This was a very, very dangerous, uh, destabilizing uh, event. It could have led to, I think, some catastrophic uh, escalation on the border. But fortunately, the Russians and the Turks backed down. And I think uh, since then, with, with, when the reality has struck Ankara that uh, there is going to be no real regime change in Syria, that the Syrian war is not going to deliver uh, the kind of result that Turkey wants. It has, Turkey has sought a new equation with the Russians. You know, uh, two years ago, in the middle of this uh, major you know, tension with Russia over Syria, the Russians and the Turks signed an agreement for uh, moving natural gas from Russia into Turkey, the so-called Turk Stream uh, pipeline. This was to go around Ukraine, you know, as Europe blocked uh, the passage of uh, Russian natural gas through Central Eastern Europe. It was hoped that this Turkish pipeline would pick up the slack. Also, the Russians promised to build a nuclear reactor inside Turkey. So these things, which, you know, these negotiations, which were happening while the conflict was going on, had to be set aside when tensions rose to a high pitch. 
And now, I think as Turkey has come to understand, or as Erdogan has come to understand the great uh, destabilized position of Turkey, he is trying to rebalance with the Russians, which is why he's going to Moscow uh, on August 9th. Uh, the Turks have openly said now that the Turk stream uh, pipeline is back on the table. The nuclear reactor is back on the table. Uh, this partly might be to put some pressure on the United States, but it's also got, I think, uh, very serious economic uh, consequences for Turkey, which it has, you know, which, I mean, in a sense, the politics uh, of the war in Syria had set aside the economics, and now there's a little bit of rebalancing taking place. Vijay, you mentioned the economy. Now, the political crisis uh, is taking a real toll on the economy. For example, the, the shooting of the Russian jet you mentioned led to an embargo, um, and Russian tourism has declined by 92 percent. Uh, the Turkish economy is 15 percent of it is tourism. So that's one example. But what else is happening in Turkey that's causing this stress on the economy? Oh, it's, a, it's been an enormous uh, economic crisis. I mean, let, let's take uh, the two major aspects, tourism and energy. Um, you know, when the uh, detritus of the Syrian war uh, entered inside uh, Turkey, which, which was inevitable, you know, uh, how, how could you have such a long border with Syria to see the destabilization in Syria and not expect it to cross the border? You know, there were attacks uh, inside very important tourist centers of Turkey, Istiklal Street, for instance, one of the main tourist drags in Istanbul. There was an attack in, in Istanbul airport. You know, these attacks uh, had a very chilling effect in general uh, for tourism. You know, Turkey had built up its, its airline, uh, Turkish Airways, as a major international carrier. That began to suffer because, after all, most flights uh, on Turkish airlines uh, go through Istanbul. The attack on the airport, I think, had a chilling effect on customers wanting to use Turkish airlines. So there was an, in general, uh, you know, uh, a crackdown, or rather, uh, there was an in general sense that tourism had declined inside Turkey. Well, the Russian tourists are major, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, have, have had a very long and, and, and deep uh, affection for Turkey, for Egypt, for other parts of the region. You know, the, the flight from Moscow to Turkey is not, not very long. Uh, it, it was a very good way to escape the Russian winter to come to the Mediterranean Sea on the Turkish coast. And with the tension rising to fever pitch between Turkey and Russia, most of these tourists simply skipped Turkey. So Turkey not only lost um, in general in terms of tourism, but it lost the important Russian tourists. In terms of energy, you know, uh, Turkey, of course, is a, is a net importer of energy. Um, having this nuclear power plant built by the Russians, uh, allowing the natural gas to enter Turkey and as well uh, transit into Europe is going to be very important for Turkey's energy security, but also it will receive rents for the natural gas that will go into Europe. These are important economic uh, you know, parameters for Turkey, and I think it's important to understand that as far as the Erdogan government is concerned, the economics has played a role, but the politics is playing an equal role here. You know, uh, being isolated, uh, you know, increasingly from Europe because of the crackdown after this coup, and also before the coup, you know, th there had been a great uh, sense of uh, trepidation about what was happening in Turkey in terms of press freedom, in terms of the arrests of editors, shutting down of newspapers, etc. This had predated the coup, but there's been a sharp uh, you know, increase in the restrictions on the press since the coup. This has isolated Turkey from Europe. But Turkey has sought uh, now to break out of this isolation. Uh, Russia is one avenue, but so too will be the, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which Turkey, I think, is going to increase its, uh, you know, uh, its role in. Uh, it's important to remember that the bridging between Turkey and Russia took place uh, because of Armenia and Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan, in particular, played an important role here. I think it has wanted to draw Turkey into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the so-called SCO, uh, you know, into this whole Silk Road project in a much deeper political way, not just an economic way. And we're seeing that happen now. 
All right, Vijay, uh, a lot there, and uh, we are hoping to have you back very soon because I think uh, we have to uh, do another project here, which is to unpack the situation uh, with the refugees, which you have written about in Alternate today, but let's do that another time. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.